So we were concluding with the idea of containment with George Kennan, and we'll resume now with how containment was really implemented under President Truman. And President Truman certainly shared Kennan's concern about the expansive nature of the Soviet Union. Uh, again, he was quite concerned about America sort of retreating back into a post-war lull, not truly recognizing the threat of an expansion of Soviet Union. And so, as Truman was looking around uh, the world, he, he recognized what was the post-war scenario in particularly the Mediterranean and Black Sea region around um, southern Russia of Turkey and Greece. Both countries uh, were experiencing serious pressure both economically but also internally from potential revolt and obviously the, the geopolitical nature of the where Greece and Turkey are located is utterly strategic and so for President Truman he made a decision that was, was pretty bold in its, in its declaration. He says the U.S. should support free people throughout the world who are resisting takeovers by armed minorities or outside pressure we must assist free people to work out their own destinies in their own way. So to translate that simply, he's saying we're going to give you money in order to stop the spread of communism. And, and that had very direct results in both the Civil War in Greece as well as pushing back for communist influences in, uh, in Turkey. And, and so the direct amount of aid was $400 million, which uh, fairly small amount of money in today's uh, politics, but uh, it was quite a bit of money at the time and was considered a rather bold statement. Uh, as a result of this, some critics would argue that, that Truman was really polarizing the world and negating uh, any opportunity for um, negotiation or for, uh, I guess you might call later, peaceful coexistence. But Truman, again, felt that if he did not, I think, uh, state the, the, the threat of the Soviet Union in as, as strong language as possible, uh, then the American people um, would allow for uh, Soviets to expand without really firing a shot. Meanwhile, uh, a perhaps even greater concern was the fate of Western Europe. The Allies, uh, particularly the, the Brits, the Belgians, the French, the Italians now, uh, and West Germany were all sort of devastated both economically but perhaps even worse at the time physically. Uh, their infrastructure was in, in utter ruin. Buildings were just leveled. And so there was a, was a real fear by State uh, Department head uh, George Marshall. General Marshall had been uh, chosen to be the, the new U.S. Secretary of State and he, after having spent uh, a bit of time looking at the issue, was, was gravely concerned uh, that a European recovery would be slow in coming. But if they coordinated their efforts, then the United States would be there as a partner and really as a financier. And this would lead to the passage of a, a key piece of Cold War legislation called the European Recovery uh, Program. And this program is commonly called the Marshall Plan. It's the Marshall Plan to rebuild Western Europe, uh, and it, it was to the the small sum of almost thirteen billion dollars. So that was an absolutely breathtaking breathtaking amount of money. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the idea of having to fight to liberate France or Belgium or Britain from communism was far stat more staggering. You may remember that the cost of the war, World War II, was three hundred and thirty billion dollars. So if you could spend less than 5% of that amount to secure peace in the West, this would be good. Uh, obviously, we had kind of learned our lesson from World War II when the Germans were really su suffering under, under reparations. The Brits and the French were forced to pay back indemnities to us from loans. Uh, and really, no one had been able to, to kind of get their own economy going. And so this European recovery program, a Marshall Plan, would be a, a great success. Soviet Union did reject uh, aid under it. Stalin distrusted Marshall. He distrusted really the 
Truman and, and felt like this was a, a way to sort of interject ourselves into um, uh, Soviet internal politics. So Marshall would become another important figure again in, in 1948 when in late 47 uh, Israel declared its independence as a nation state after having been recently established through what's called the Partition of Palestine. Uh, President Truman was considering recognizing Israel uh, and he had several things weighing on him but Marshall and the other key advisors to the president highly recommended that he not do that uh, out of fear of alienating the Arabs, fear of particularly you know, uh, angering the, the Russians, the Soviets. But nonetheless, uh, Israel declared its independence on, on May the 14th, 1948, and the United States um, was right there to recognize it as a nation. And obviously today, Israel is a key uh, member of the U.S. diplomatic relations. So why did Truman, you know, make this sort of difficult political decision uh, that would have real ramifications in the long run? Uh, one is, of course, the American sympathy uh, for, for the Holocaust survivors. Um, 21 million Jewish people had been uprooted. Of that number, 7 million had been murdered in the, in the Holocaust. And so there were millions of, of sort of uh, displaced Jewish refugees. And as they had begun to migrate to Palestine, there was a, a sentiment that these were the, the folks that you know, that had a, needed a homeland and that Israel was its ancestral homeland. He was also keen on making sure that the Soviet Union not gain an advantage in any part of the region uh, and of the world, really. And if the Soviet Union had sort of taken the leap, then perhaps we would have been left out in the cold, so to, so to speak. Uh, also key con uh, constituency, constituency, our Jewish American voters have long been uh, you know, an important ethnic group here in the United States and voted uh, pretty much routinely for the Democratic Party as a result of this. And then lastly, Israel is a democracy. Um, it's a, a democratic state in the Middle East. At the time, the only one. And to have a, a, a parliamentary representative body like the Knesset that we could maintain relations with, share values with, uh, serve as great uh, significance. Uh, it's interesting to note that Dr. Ralph Bunch would uh, be a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Palestinians obviously were not uh, open or receptive to, to, this, to this initial settlement. Uh, Dr. Bunch would be the first uh, African-American or person and person of color to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And then we see an, a really overwhelming shift in the historic nature of the United States, uh, also within a year of each other. In 1947, the National Security Act was passed. Uh, and the National Security Act of 1947 would have just titanic uh, repercussions, uh, and its, its echoes are still felt today. Prior to 1947, we had a War Department uh, and a wartime military after NSA 47 we had the Department of Defense which created an all new um, headquarters at the US Pentagon across the Potomac here in Virginia uh, we also had the creation of the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff the various uh, heads of each of the branches as well as the chairman created a permanent body in the White House the National Security Council uh, where you have the individual give the daily briefing to the, the president, the national security advisor, played a, a dramatic role in the second half of the 20th century. Of course, perhaps most famously, uh, or infamously, the formation of the CIA. Uh, we got our experience from the Brits in, in World War II, and we created our own Office of Secret Services that would be a foreign intelligence gathering agency headed by the Director of National Intelligence. So the CIA becomes a uh, invaluable agency to obtain information. Of course, as the Cold War proceeds, it will become an agency that at times interjects itself, injects itself into conflict and, and will be historically noted for that. You had an interesting uh, sort of propaganda machine created with uh, the Voice of America. This was a, a radio broadcast that would broadcast behind the Iron Curtain into uh, communist countries or communist controlled countries. Voice of America was part of 
the Radio Free Europe mindset. Um, you know, ultimately rock and roll and American music and American stories and the news would find its way uh, even through the Iron Curtain. And then perhaps most notably for young people was the creation of a permanent, uh, at least up until recently, permanent peacetime draft eligibility. We do still have it active through the selective service system. However, the, the U.S. Armed Forces haven't used a draft since Vietnam. But the Selective Service Act, service act everyone, uh, every male turns 18 has to register by law uh, and be eligible for conscription. Uh, so just keep that in mind, fellas. You are still technically eligible to be drafted, although I'd say the probability of that are highly unlikely. And then uh, as the militarization of the war continue of uh, the Cold War continues, uh, you see something, uh, you know, again, absolutely historic for America, and that's a departure from our our traditional role as, as isolationist and individualistic to joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in North, 1949. North Atlantic, not North American. NATO, NATO is formed in 1949, headquarters in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, the U.S., the Brits, the Belgians, the Canadians, the Danes, the French, Italians, Dutch, Norwegians, uh, the Western Alliance, uh, the North Atlantic Alliance, which has been expanded several times. And this is a peacetime alliance, uh, which says basically if, if a member state is attacked, it is an attack upon all other members. And so Truman pushed us uh, in the direction of needing military security. Uh, it was clear that the threat of communism towards Western Europe was legitimate. Unfortunately, the Soviets responded in kind with the formation in 1955 of the Warsaw Pact. We have virtually all the Iron, uh, Iron Curtain countries in that military alliance. And so you would have these two sort of military rivalries that face off. One of the great uh, contextual questions is what to do now that the Soviet Union has collapsed and the Cold War has ended. We still have a North Atlantic Treaty, and some of those, several of those post-Soviet republics have wished to join NATO. Obviously, Russia is not in NATO, and so that creates interesting uh, ramifications for our time. So, as we resume in our next video, we will take up the question of Asia in both China and in Korea. Thank you.